Hi guys, happy Saturday. I don't know where what it's like where you are, but today it is rainy and cold and the perfect day to be curled up in the studio with a great cup of tea and uh, painting with a bunch of really great friends. So thanks for joining me today. I'm so glad to have you. <sighs> be fierce. I love this one. Bright colors, all my favorite things, bumblebees, butterflies, and dragonflies. And of course, a positive message. Got to have that in there. But before we get into painting, I have to give you the winner from last week's live and a little drum roll, Miss Vera Souther. Sweetie, send me your mailing address and we will get your set of microns out to you. I almost forgot which ones we had given away. We have a gorgeous six brush set of Dynasty Micron for you, Vera. So just get in touch with me and let me know where I have to mail them and we will get those to you. Um, what else? Um, been a really weird week. Seemed like we had so much to do and never seemed to get as much done as we hoped to. And yet when I look back at it, we got so much accomplished, but uh, there's always more to do than what you can realistically get done in a five day span. Today is a really busy day. I'm doing this live today. And then this afternoon, I'm teaching at Autumn Fest. Uh, with Lana Lamb, Sandy McTeer, and Marco. I'm really excited about that. We are painting mixed media orchids this afternoon. So that'll be fun. I'm really looking forward to that one. So today we're gonna paint Be Fierce and I think we're just about ready to get started. So the piece that we're working on is the three postage stamp pieces. One is a butterfly, a dragonfly, and a bumblebee. And the process to get there is actually quite simple, but it is, there are a lot of little steps in between. So we're going to start with the absolute basics. So the background in this particular case is just based with uh, Titan Buff or light buttermilk or warm white, whatever you have on hand, as long as it's a light color. The paper that I used is from Tim Holtz. And it comes in a roll like this. Um, it's fabulous stuff. The problem is, is that like so many products these days, they're either unavailable or discontinued. Uh, but I happen to have a really big roll of this stuff in my stash of goodies in the back. But because it is discontinued, I thought it behooved me to come up with a solution to replace it. So this is what we're going to do. I have a piece here, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. But I have a surface already base coated. In this case, I put two coats of Titan Buff on the surface, and then I gave it a light sanding. And then I'm gonna take my stamp pad, which is this, this one is a stays on stamp pad. I've got a couple of Stampenda stamps, and I have a stencil. And we're going to replicate that paper by using stamps and stencils. So I'm going to start with this script. This is the Vintage Note stamp from Stampendous. This is one that I think is probably my favorite. I use it in everything. So I'm going to stamp like so. I'm not really worried about getting it utterly perfect. And then I have a canceled postage stamp. I'm going to tuck that in here. I like it to overlap the script. I'm gonna do a little more of this. So I'm gonna go in a different direction. I'm going to go this way, just so that it has sort of that replicating that paper. And I'm gonna do it again, but I think like that. Perfect. So I've got the stamps on, and now I'm going to take my stencil, put those aside, now the one that I'm using is, this is postage, it's in the M square line. And I'm going to position my stencil, I'm going to tape it in place so that it doesn't shift. Oops, really? Tape and acrylic tips don't go together. And I'm gonna grab a stencil brush here. And I'm going to work with a little bit of lamp black or carbon black. If you're using the fluid acrylic, you can use the carbon black. And I'm going to blend that color into my stencil brush so that it's well distributed. 
and I'm going to lightly stencil, circular fashion, change directions frequently. Here we go. So I've got my stamp in one corner. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to choose this one. I don't often use this postage stamp design, but I think in this case, this is perfect for it. I'm going to tuck that in. I kind of like that it's got all this movement in it, these, especially these horizontal cancellation lines. There we go. A little bit of black. Could you use themed tissue paper? Absolutely you could use themed tissue paper. I shy away from one with color in it simply because they have a tendency to bleed when they get wet, um, depending on the type of tissue paper, but uh, absolutely. You can use almost anything for this. You could use tissue paper, you could use napkins, you could use scrapbook paper, you could use a photocopy if you wanted to. They will all work. So there I go. I've managed to replicate that sort of postage look that we would have gotten with the paper. So you can see what the paper looks like. And then this is the two that I've done using the stamps and the stencils. And it's just creating a little background interest, a little pattern, a little texture, and that's all it's for. So it's an easy thing to replicate. And so if you can't find the paper, then dig out some of your favorite stamps and a stencil and work from there. Easy peasy. So this is what we're going to work towards using the tissue paper. Now the tissue paper is just slightly smaller than the surface. Don't worry about any borders or edges. By the time we're done, you'll never see them anyway. So we're going to work with putting this paper onto the surface. Now I've already cut mine out so that it fits within the confines of that ornament. And the medium we're going to use is matte medium. And I had to dig into my stash to find another bottle. I uh, am running low on supplies. I think like everybody else, there's certain things that I'm running low on. So uh, the matte medium, this is the Decorate Media matte medium. I love this stuff. You're going to put a generous coat on the surface Neatness doesn't count. Perfection is to be avoided at all costs. Just get it on. Well, does it matter if it is a inkjet printer or not? Inkjet, I tend to avoid an inkjet simply because they're usually a vegetable-based or a water-based ink and putting moisture on them causes them to run. So I usually will recommend a photocopy or a laser print. And hello from Roma, Italy. Hello from New Maryland, New Brunswick to Roma, Italy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to let that sit for just a second. Now to lay this paper in, I like to let it catch, which means I sort of drag it like so until it catches. And then I drop it in and I use my fingers to smooth it out. And then I have this handy dandy little tool. This is a brayer. It's a, a mini brayer. This one is from Tim Holtz. You can get these on Amazon. They're about seven to eight dollars. They're worth every penny. <laughs> so I just roll it so that it's well seated in that paper. And you will get a little of the matte medium that oozes out. That's okay. I usually just take my fingers to wipe the excess off. And I don't seal this until after it's dry. I let that first coat dry completely before I apply a second layer of the matte medium over top of it. So we've got that on there. You can see that that paper adheres beautifully. You don't have to wet this one. It lays in gorgeous and it doesn't buckle. I've never had this paper buckle. If you were working with a photocopy, uh, you know, much like this one, um, make sure that you moisten the paper before you lay it into the 
matte medium so then you won't get any b bubbles or ripples or any buckling in the paper if the paper is moist but with this Tim Holtz paper I've never had it buckle and ripple it's not it has a strange texture to it so I'm going to set this one aside let this one dry I have a dry one here and it is nice and dry and we're going to start putting some color in now the colors I'm using are the fluid acrylic you can do this with the Americana you don't need to have the fluid acrylic to do this just when you're choosing colors make sure you choose really bright ones and they will have to be thinned out a little to get this effect so that you're not burying all of this great texture and, and pattern in there and I need a dioxin. So the first four colors we're going to have on the palette are dioxazine purple, cobalt teal hue, and diarylide yellow, and primary magenta. So essentially it's a basic, a very basic palette. So with a nice wet brush, I'm using a half inch angle, going to start in this upper left hand corner with diarylide yellow, which is that school bus in your face yellow. And you're just going to slip slap that color on. You can do this with a piece of paper towel, with a baby wipe, but I kind of like the brush. And then you just let that color sort of run out. So we're going to do one quarter of this surface with some diarylide. Look how bright that yellow is. That is an in your face yellow. And then I'm going into the cobalt teal and I'm going to start in the corner, just like I did with the yellow, and I'm going to work out, slip slap, until the two colors meld and overlap. And the first thing you'll notice is that with that yellow, you get an almost citron green tone where it overlaps yellow, that's great. The other nice thing is I can let this dry if the color isn't quite strong enough to suit me. I can let this dry and then I can reapply it. But I want this to come down about one quarter of the way. So now I have half of my surface covered. Well, that's a neat feature. Let you know when a person has shared it by putting share beside oh, the name. Oh, cool. So the next color is this Diox Purple. I'll give you a heads up. The Diox is really strong. So don't freak out. It is a very intense color, so you're going to have to be a little less heavy-handed with it because it is very strong. Oh, what comes in the pattern pack? In the pattern packet are uh, full color step outs. All of the line drawings are in there, plus the detailed written instructions for each element in this pattern. It has a complete supply list as well. And now I'm going to get into that primary magenta, that beautiful, rich magenta red. And I'm going to start in the corner again. And I'm going to work out from it until the colors overlap. Now when it overlaps that purple, you're going to get a really pretty pinkish purple hue. And then when it comes up over that yellow, you're going to get a gorgeous vermilion orange. How pretty is that? So I'm going to take my heat gun to this and just dry it really quick. I cooked off my other heat gun yesterday literally cooked it <laughs> so I had to go and get the other one out I have two of the very same I've had them for about 15 years and the one that I used the most finally died a very slow and painful death yesterday so had to find a new one so there I have it I have all of my colors on and you'll notice I didn't worry too much about straight lines I just wanted colors to overlap I wanted you know, to see that transition from the blue into the purple and from the purple into the, the magenta you haven't used that in a while. Yeah. 
kind of smells kind of funky. Yeah, it's, you can smell the dust burning. <laughs> it's a problem when you have two or three or something. One of them never gets used. What is the size of the wood surface? The wood surface, I believe, is about um, four by five, I think. Let's find out, shall we? It's one of the nice things. I have all the toys in the studio, so. Where can they get it? It is four by five. Look at that, I was right. <laughs> the surface itself is available with, I actually have three suppliers that you can get these from. Vikingwoodcrafts.com is one. Bearwithus.com, or it's bearwithusinc.com, sorry. And cdwood.com. So cupboard distributing, bear with us, and Viking all carry this surface. So I've let mine dry, but I wanted to intensify these colors. So I'm just going to put a nice little layer of each of these. This is what I love about the fluid acrylics is that I can layer, layer, layer without burying everything. I can intensify the colors. I can get lots of vibrancy out of this. So I'm going to do the same thing with that cobalt teal hue. Look how pretty that is. These colors are so vibrant. And then I'm going to go into that diorolite yellow, even though that color is really strong. <laughs> I just laid my arm in the black paint. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, they get all the black paint off of me. There we go. That's what you get for moving your palette. Yeah. So a little of that diorylide yellow, look at how hot these colors get. And they'll get more intense each time I put a layer of color on, which is what I love about them. The other great thing is that I can layer this because once these are completely dry, they don't reactivate. So I can continue to layer and layer and layer. So I'm gonna take the dryer and dry this. The other nice thing is these dry very quickly with or without the, the heat gun. So look how vibrant those colors are. So now once we've got all of this on we have another step to do and we're going to grab that matte medium and we're going to seal that color down nice and tight. You don't have to do this but I'm going to tell you why I'm recommending that you do. So once we get that on this has two benefits. One, it's going to seal that paper in there completely. And two, anything that we do after this, we will be able to erase. So if we make a whoopsie when we're stenciling or painting something and you want to clean it up, because we've got this barrier between the two layers of paint, you can do that without damaging what you've already done. So matte medium is a fantastic barrier coat. So once you complete each stage, whether it's doing your base coats, put a coat of matte medium over top of it. It's going to have a twofold impact. One, it's going to protect what you've already done. And two, it will give you a nice uniform matte finish to work over. So you'll be able to control things much better. Love Map Medium. It's a great product. Linda is wondering, where do you get the paints? The Decorart Fluid Acrylics are available from MaureenBaker.com right now, and they're also available on the Decorart website. However, with things the way they currently are, there's a lot of shortages, so some of the colors aren't necessarily available. So, um, I'm usually recommending choose four to six colors in the palette and just work with those. Uh, that <laughs> so there we have a really nice base on which to start our pieces. So I'm going to set this one aside to dry. I've already prepped a few others. 
So I have actually prepared all three of them. And someone had asked me a question yesterday about which one we were actually going to paint. Although I'm going to focus on doing the butterfly, I am going to show you how to complete each of them. So that the goal is, is so that we will have three completed pieces by the end of, of the live today. So I've already base coated and prepped mine, but let me walk you through. Oh, here we go. Is matte medium like decoupage medium? No, it is not. A decoupage medium actually has a high acrylic resin in it that is used for sealing things permanently. It can even act as a, a, a sealer or a varnish. Whereas the matte medium is a medium. You can mix paint into it, you can tint it, you can add color to it, you can work over top of things with it, you can utilize it as an adhesive or an image transfer medium. So it, it is a multifunctional product in that regard. So I have, um, as I said, I've got all of my pieces base coated and the process is very simple. So each of those elements have been base coated with uh, white. I've used warm white. I would recommend using gesso because it's going to cover up a lot of that um, stuff that's in the background and it'll make it easier for you to base coat. So the one that I use is the media gesso, but any gesso will work. And if you can't get gesso, then just use white paint. And I would recommend using the warm white simply because it has much better opacity. It'll probably only take two coats as opposed to using titanium white where it's going to take four or five. So I'm using gesso to base and that's everything. I base coat everything with the gesso. And then for the butterfly, once the gesso is dry, I dropped my line drawing back into place and traced all of the, de the detail elements. And once those were done, then I just filled in all of that black area using the carbon black or the lamp black. For the dragonfly, the wings are done with either the gesso or the warm white, and the body and legs are all based with the carbon black or the lamp black. For the bumblebee, all of the black body is done with carbon black or lamp black. When I base coat this bumblebee, you'll notice, I don't know if you can see it or not, there's a very tiny space between each segment. I leave that blank. It makes things a little easier for you when it comes to highlighting and shading that bumblebee. Then the wings are base coated with either the gesso or the warm white. And the bands that will be yellow are base coated with gesso or warm white as well. So that is your prep for these pieces. Now I'm gonna grab my bowl of tricks here. I got it my... <laughs> I can't get my eraser out. Oh. My eraser is stuck down at the bottom of my jar. Here. Nope. Can't get it. <laughs> oh. Tack with it. I'll use one of the other ones. So, once I have everything base coated, I take my eraser and I go around and I clean up all those graphite lines off of that white paint. You don't want the graphite showing through the color when we get it on there. So for the butterfly, we have a couple of options. Um, I like to use either the diarylite yellow I really do love that diarylite. I the way that color just jumps off the surface is wonderful. In the pattern, it asks for primary yellow, uh, but you can use either or. So if you don't have the diarylite, you can use the primary. If you don't have the primary, you can use the diarylite. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to float, just wash a little color of that diarylite right over all of those white spaces on the wings. You can see how intense that color is. And I'm not, I'm not being too persnickety about it. I'm just getting the color in. We're going to go back in and touch up all of that black anyhow. 
beforehand to clean up all of the edges. There we go. Now, we're going to do that same thing with the bumblebee, and you're going to use that diarylide or the primary yellow on the body, on that thorax, and cover up all of that, that white. So those two colors are translated very well. So on those details of the wings, this is where your orange comes into play. Now in the pattern, I've asked for vermilion, which is a really deep in your face orange. I don't have any. So I'm going to work with, this one is pyrrole orange, which is a little bit brighter. And we're going to put a float of that color down towards the body inside these little areas here. Always at the bottom end of that segment. And it's a weak float. I'm not really putzing with it all that much. I'm not looking for perfection. I just want to get that color in. Now I'm using, this one is a 3 8 angle, but a half inch angle, quarter inch angle will do just fine. Or if you prefer using a flat, then by all means use the flat. And I like that little punch of orange just in towards the body on each one of those segments. It keeps things looking nice and hot. Pretty quiet. It is quiet. Even in the comments, it's quiet. It's one of two things. Everybody either fell asleep <laughs> or, they're busy painting. or they're busy painting. I'm hoping they're busy painting. This is a really fun piece to do. It is not difficult by any stretch. I mean, your butterflies are gonna to come together really quickly. And I've limited how many colors I used. I tried to keep that color palette as concise and as simple as possible. I think a lot of the time that we're just inundated with so many different colors and you only use a dot of each one. So I'm going to take that orange, now that my butterfly is done, I'm going to come over and I'm going to do the same thing to my bumblebee. It doesn't really matter which side you do this on. I just happen to like this side today. Not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Enthralled watching. There we go. And you can see how intense those fluid acrylics are, I mean, that, it, especially on that yellow, it just comes screaming off of there. We're all just mesmerized. <laughs> <laughs> I love the vibrancy of this. These intense colors just, they're so pretty. It's that high contrast. Contrast isn't necessarily just about black and white. So you can see by putting that shadow, one wide on one side and one narrower on the other side, it instantly creates a, sort of a highlight in the center of the thorax of that bee. So I'm gonna give that a chance to dry. I'm gonna hit it. Those colors you changed up, are they still fluid acrylic? Yes, they are. <laughs> griping about my heat gun. <laughs> what, it's what, 13 years old? It's 13 it's years old, and it's the, I think it's probably only the second time that one's been used. So it's, uh, yeah, it's making weird smells. Not as weird as the other one did when it died. Is that a wet palette? This one, no, it is not. I very rarely use a wet palette. Oh, it moved on me. You 
we're still using the same paint puddles you started with? Yes. Yeah. That's what it is. Now, the interesting thing about the fluid acrylics is that they do dry very quickly. Um, but if you find that they're drying too fast for you and you're working on a dry palette, uh, keep a small mister handy full of um, distilled water and just mist them lightly. It'll keep them wet a little bit longer. The other option is to add just a drop of extender to them. So when you put them out on your palette, just add one tiny drop of extender to the fluid acrylics and they'll stay wet for you quite a long time. Uh oh. I used clear glazing medium by Joe Sonia like you're using the matte medium. Oh. Have you ever used it? Uh, have I ever used the Joe Sonia's uh, glazing, medium. glazing medium? Yeah, I have. Um, I use, there's two things by Joe Sonia that I use constantly. Um, one I have not been able to get during this pandemic. It's just not anywhere. I wish it was because I am out completely. But instead, I've been using this um, magic mix. Uh, now it's called a light sealer containing extender for more open time that dries matte. I don't use this one as an adhesive, but I do use it more as a flow medium. So I've been using it for floating and highlighting and glazing techniques and for a variety of things, but I don't find it has quite enough body to be used as an adhesive. It does dry crystal clear. Uh, that's one of the things that I absolutely love about this magic mix is the, the clarity and the fact that it dries to an absolutely dead flat finish, which I love. The, um, my favorite is the Joe Sonia fast drying glaze. I use that one for everything. It is my float medium, my flow medium, my glazing medium. I use that stuff for everything. But uh, because it hasn't been available, I decided to try this magic mix and I've been very pleasantly surprised. So I now have four bottles of this. <laughs> but I'd be willing to trade one for some fluid, from, for some fast drying glaze. <laughs> or a schmaltum. Or a because I'm down to my last two bottles. <laughs> In simple terms, what's the difference between media paint and Americana? The, in the simplest possible terms, what it comes down to is transparency. Fluid acrylics have a very high pigment load, which means they have much, much more color in them than the Americana. The Americana has a very high solid load, which means that they're far more opaque. So that's the primary difference. They are both made with a high quality acrylic resin, which means you're going to get great adhesion. You're going to get great long-term durability. The other thing is that the pigments within the fluid acrylic have a higher light fastness. So they will do much better under long-term exposure to light, depending on the color. Each color has a different uh, degree of light fastness. If I were to make a one word difference, Decoart is a, the Decoart Americana would be a high quality decorative art paint. The fluid acrylic would be a high quality fine art paint. That would be the simplest possible terms. If I were to find a comparable product on the market, it would be the golden fluid acrylics. But I would tend to lean towards the, the media line simply for cost and for quality. I love the quality of these paints. And are extenders and control mediums the same? Control mediums, extender actually just extends the open time. It keeps the paint from drying. Control mediums like flow mediums and whatnot are designed to help paint moves brush out smoother and level. But it doesn't really do anything for the length of the drying time. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad I answered the question. Yay me! <laughs> so now my bumblebee and my butterfly are dry. So I'm going to set these guys aside for a second. We're going to come over to this dragonfly because I want to show you how to finish out this guy because he's really simple. And we're going to use the same technique on the bumblebee finish him as well. So I'm going into my cobalt teal hue, which is my favorite color in the fluid acrylics. Just like Bahama blue is my favorite color in the Americanas, the cobalt teal hue is my favorite in the fluid acrylic. So 
So I'm going to put a weak float of that cobalt teal on the wings close to where it joins the body. Not quite that weak though. That was a little too weak. <laughs> I love this color. Remember what I said about the matte medium being able to fix things? See where I went over the surface? I'm going to take a point blender with a little bit of water and I can clean that color out. And that's because that matte medium is on there. So if I catch it before the paint dries, I can fix it. that little bit of blue on those wings. And you're going to do the same thing on the tip of the wing. <laughs> I made a mistake when I ordered paint from Stockade and ended up with an extra bottle of Ashvaltum, if you need a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I get panicky when I only have three on my shelf. <laughs> What would you use to get Americana to be fluid since we're not able to get the mixed media in Quebec? The fluid acrylics? Yeah. Yes, you can get them in Quebec. Country Bear wood is available in Quebec. They're based in Sherbrooke and they are a decor distributor and they carry the fluid acrylics. Oh, well, there you go. Unless they're out of stock. <laughs> they're a decor distributor. <laughs> There we go. So that little bit of blue, again, um, still implies that the wing is white, but <laughs> leaves the center of those wings crisp white and gives them a highlight. <laughs> it's my favorite color. I, oh. Bahama but blue. beside Bahama Blue, it's probably the color that I use the most out of any of them, the Americano or the Fluid Acrylics. I don't know that I can paint without them. There. So having that little bit of blue towards the body and at the tip of the wings leaves this area open and implies a curve in the wing. Now I'm going to do the same thing to the wings on the bumblebee. I'm going to, oops, a little too much water in my brush. I'm going to take that blue towards the center of the body on the wing, on both wings. I have way too much water in my brush and I messed up my float. There we go. It's a little float in here. And I'm going to do the same thing at the tip of the wings. Just a nice weak float. There, and you can see these guys are really coming along. Now, I like, <laughs> yes boss. <laughs> so I'm going to grab some Americana lamp black, maybe, then again, maybe not. I got it, there we go. Now this is the opportunity now the brush that I'm using for this is, um, this is a Micron. And this one is the 10 aught Extra Long Detail Liner. I like this one. So I, this is where I like to clean up things a little bit. I just go around and touch up with some black, round out edges, clean up little spots, you know, that are looking a little ragged touch up areas. 
just so that everything has that nice clean line. I tend to putz with things. I go back and forth and crisp up this line and straighten that out so that everything is just the way I want it. Oops. That's what you don't want to hear. Oops. <laughs> there we go. I think you should answer this question at the end. Okay. During your outro. More advice than anything. Okay. Fair enough. So I've got the color in the wings on the dragonfly. I have the color in the wings on the bumblebee. And I've done the highlighting and whatnot on my butterfly. So I'm going to take this off and we're going to talk about all of those little details in here. Now I've done mine with warm white. Put a little warm white on my palette. Now you can do this with a liner, you can do it with a stylus, um, whatever brush or tool works for you. And you're going to start adding dots. Now the ones I like to start with are the, the larger dots. And I usually will do that with the end of a brush. The, you know, not the business end, the other end. And I just sort of copy what I see on my line drawing. And I like putting those dots in like so. There's always a space for a couple in here. There we go. So once I have the larger dots in place, that's when I take my liner brush or my stylus and I start filling in those gaps with all those tiny little dots. Now these just sort of fill in those spaces. There's no real rhyme or reason to them, I'm just putting them in. Now you can make them close together or far apart, larger or smaller. I think that the, the larger dots sort of draw the eye and the smaller dots just sort of keep things looking nice and fanciful. Just like so. So this part actually goes very quickly. And again, there's no real rhyme or reason to them. I'm just popping them in. Easy peasy. There we go. So one more little bit. These little dots seem to finish off this butterfly quite nicely. And I'm gonna show you a little trick if you wanna add a little extra dimension to these butterflies. So I have all of these dots in and once your white dots are dry, you can take a dot of black and put them in the center of some of those larger dots and it just creates a little more interest in them so they don't just look like a big white dot. Just makes them look more fun. And it creates a little more something different in them. Just like that. Almost like eyes. So to finish out that butterfly, I'm going to give that white a chance to dry. To finish out that butterfly, I like to take a float of Eschvaltum. I know you're very surprised by that. Because Eschvaltum is like my, 
my go-to color for all sorts of things. But the trick to it is getting that float nice and weak. So you work with a very small amount of color and blend it out so that that color is very transparent. And then you're going to take it to the yellow and right over that orange. Just a weak float of Eschvaltum. And it does two things. It softens any boundaries. It subdues the color a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. I managed to get a little bit of black paint on my brush. There we go. But by subduing it, it also does not kill the color. It just warms it all up together. Gets rid of those little harsh boundaries that may have been there. And it gives those yellows and oranges a nice rich warm feel without canceling them out altogether. So there is that little bit of asphaltum. Now I'm going to do that to the bumblebee as well. It's a nice float of asphaltum. Just like so. Nice. So we have all of our color in our bumblebee and our butterfly. So our next bet is going to be adding highlights to these two creatures. And we're going to do that with a little bit of warm white. And I'm going to, again, blend that out well. I don't want the color full strength. So blend it out well. And I'm going to start with the butterfly. The butterfly is going to get a little highlight on the back. Apparently they need a face to the voice. Oh. <laughs> and I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the bumblebee, I'm going to use that thin float of warm white on the top edge of each segment. Just like that. And it's just a weak float of color on each segment. And you're going to do the same thing to the legs. Remember what I said about that fine line? This is going to be your guide. And then each of the legs gets that just a weak little float, like so. And then you're going to, that same brush, that same color, you're going to come down on the body of this and where that bright spot is in the center of the bee, we're going to add a chisel blend. And all that means is that it's loaded as if to float. And it's a tap and pull just to add a little texture to that bee. But the focus is going in the center where that highlight is. And that little chisel blend helps keep him fuzzy looking. Uh, just check the country bear. Most of the principal colors you use are out of stock. <laughs> yeah, seems to be the song that's being played a lot these days. But um, I know that Dacwort is working to get product out to the distributors. It's just taking time, sadly. Okay, so I've got my highlight on my bumblebee. I've got my shading in. So there's that little line that we were talking about. How do we fill that in? We're going to take a little bit of lamp black, as if you're going to float. You can do this with a small angle. If you're really pressed, you can do it with a liner. And I'm just going to turn my bee upside down and I'm going to float that lamp black. Uh, 
and I'm just going to fill in those gaps with a loose float of the lamp black. You can do it with a liner brush, I just prefer to float it in because then it's a softer line of color. There we go. So we have our bumblebee done, we have our butterfly done, and our dragonfly is almost done. We're just going to add that same highlight to each of the segments on the dragonfly. Same method, very weak float of warm white. Blend it out well so that you don't have a ton of harsh color in there. And we're going to put, whoops, what's on my brush here? There we go. A little highlight at the top of the segment. Same with the head. That bee looks 3D. <laughs> <laughs> and Maybe I'm going to... Even highlights can do. I'm just putting a little float of that warm white at the end of each segment. Just like that. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> so I have the highlight on. I'm going to grab my micron again and a little bit of that warm white. Get some water in that. And I'm just going to put a little stroke on the upper left side of each segment, like so, here, here, here. And there we have the highlights on our dragonfly. I'm going to do the same thing to my bumblebee. Just little one. I do like these little punches of light. It kind of makes them look shiny. That was thunder. We can hear thunder rumbling in the distance. It's raining pretty good. So, we've got those guys done. So, in that background, you might have noticed that there is this series of leaves. And those are done very simply with a liner brush loaded with asphaltum. So Janet will be painting today Sweet Summer Chickadee, which she bought last week. Mm -hmm. And is doing it on a 16 by 20. Ooh, nice. She also enlarged it by 180%. Wow. <laughs> got to send us pictures. Yes, ma'am. You send us pictures. I would love to see that. So I'm just using a liner to stroke in these leaves. Just the outline of it. And then I'm going to show you how to finish this out because we're essentially just going to create some shadow leaves, so to speak. Just a little texture and detail for the background. And then I have this really cool um, chipboard piece that we're going to add to this. So you'll notice that I have that line work done in all three of these. So while this one's drying... Well, I guess I'm not taking the dog for a walk. <laughs> not unless you're taking your water wing. So, her water wings. Her water wings. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I'm not worried about the dog being able to swim. <laughs> so I'm going to float the bottom of that leaf with a schwaltum. Just the bottom. Keeping the darkest value towards the very bottom of, this, of that leaf. Tuck it in nice and tight, like so. Got all three. I'll go over to my dragonfly.
Oops. So that little bit of color at the base just gives them a little bit of shape, defines their shape better, and implies that they have color. I think this one is dry. Yep. <coughs> You. <laughs> and I'm going to do the same thing on this butterfly one. These are really pretty. I think, you know, if you had those little tiny um, wood easels and just have these sitting up on an easel, they'd be really pretty. They're pretty as ornaments have hanging around, whether they're just hanging on the wall or in a window. They're just very bright and colorful, but I think they'd be really sweet sitting on little little wooden easels. So now that I have that shadow in place, we have to put a highlight in. And I'm going to do that with a little bit of warm white. Now I'm brushing this out very well because I don't want it to bury everything. One of the unique things about the uh, fluid acrylics is that we actually have three whites in the fluid acrylic line. We have titanium white, which is that very cold, bright white. And then we have this one, which is a translucent white, and we have titanium buff. Titanium buff is very much like a light buttermilk. It, it is a slight yellow cast to it. The translucent white is white, but it's very transparent. So if you don't have warm white and you do have the translucent white, you can do this part with that. But I'm working with warm white. And we're going to add a highlight to the tips of these leaves, but we're going to do it inside that line of asphaltum. Like this. Now what it's going to do is that it's slightly opaque, so it's going to subdue those colors a little bit. And it's going to brighten the tip of the leaf, but without burying everything. Just like that. Your last zoom there, was the audio okay? Or? Yeah, it was fine. Yeah. So there we go. I'm zooming this afternoon, doing Artem Fest, Autumn Fest. Why do I want to call it Artem Fest? Artem Fest. <laughs> Autumn Fest with Lana Lamb and Marco and Sandy. Uh, Lana is teaching this morning. Is Marco doing that beach one? Uh, Marco is doing Summer Wave, which is that gorgeous oh, wave painting. It's beautiful. He's teaching that tomorrow. If you ever get a chance to take a class with Marco, he is amazing. Absolutely amazing. There's a lot of teachers out there that are now um, offering Zoom classes. They're a bit more intensive than what we're doing here. Um, because you're literally working over a period of four to five to six hours to complete a piece of artwork. Um, there's a couple that I would love to do. Um, one, I would love to do one with uh, Mark Menendez. And uh, I'd love to do one with Marco, too. He's incredible. I'd like to do a colored pencil class with Mark Menendez. There we go. And we've got one last one to do. And then I'm gonna get my assistant here to um, grab me the chipboard off my desk because it's sitting on my desk. How do you take a class with Marco in Zoom class? Um, he's going to be offering a couple. He's doing teaching one tomorrow with Art Autumn Fest. Um, Marco is amazing. If you've never had a chance to take a class with him, his classes are phenomenal. He's a very skilled teacher. 
There we go. So I've got my highlights onto those leaves in the background. So now the only thing we have left to do is to add some shading to our pieces. I've already done it on these two. And that is done with a little bit of a schvaltum. Is there a website where they can go sign up or? For Mark? Marker's class tomorrow? No, that one is closed. Oh, is it? Yeah. So I'm just putting a float of asphaltum into the corners and along the edges of this. You'll notice that the color is not strong. Again, it's a weak float, just enough to subdue the color a little bit. But this has a, a very specific effect that we're looking for. Putting a float of that asphaltum on the edges and in the corners of this piece lets the center of the piece remain nice and bright and in so doing puts all of the emphasis on the bumblebee, the butterfly, and the dragonfly. So if at any time you find that your bumblebees or dragonflies aren't really jumping off the surface the way you would like to, try darkening the edges of your piece. By so doing, it puts all the light towards the center and makes those things pop right up. That is a neat effect. Helps drive the eye to the focal point. Well, the, the effect I like is the... Oh, you and the paint leaf. that over top of the background, mm -hmm. but it still looks like it's... Separate. Behind <laughs> the background. That's cool. So this is, to me, is such a fun technique, but we still have a couple of steps and one of them involves using my gel pen. I love these, absolutely love these. The Uniball Signo, that's super fine. He keeps directing me to keep them inside the shot. <laughs> um, that super fine stainless steel ball, these work beautifully over top of acrylic paint. They roll nice and smooth and you can do super fine detail with them, which is what I really like. So I'm gonna start with the dragonfly. I like going around the edges of my dragonfly with my gel pen. And I don't really mind if it goes onto the white or onto the background. And I do this like two or three times so that I get this really sketchy line all the way around the wing. And I do that to each wing. And what that does is it sort of gives it a softer effect and it sharpens the wing, sharpens the detail, draws the eye to it, lifts it off of the surface. Beautiful butterfly. And I like that sketchy look. <laughs> I must. <laughs> Just like that. Great fun. And I do the same thing to the bumblebee. Now I'm going all the way around and I do it two or three times. I don't worry about whether or not it's on the white or if it's on the background. If they overlap, that's okay. That light sketchy appearance just softens them and defines them at the same time. They're so lovely. Each one would make a wonderful, wonderful card. Yes, they would. You can easily do this on watercolor paper. Absolutely do this on watercolor paper. It would make gorgeous little inserts for greeting cards. Happy birthday. <laughs> So there, I've done this, this sketchy outline on each of the wings. Now I'm going to grab my fugly brush. Of course. Of course. Can't do anything without my fugly brush. I'm going to get it wet. And I'm going to choose a little bit of asphaltum for this part, of course. And I'm going to spatter my surface. I like spatter. This sort of unifies, softens and unifies things a little bit. 
when I took a class with you, you gave us one of these pens. I now guard it with my life. <laughs> I love my gel pen. They're just, they're phenomenal. The next thing I'm doing is taking a little bit of that warm white in my fugly brush and I'm going to lightly spatter this as well, but very lightly. Just want a little of that white on things. I like the fugly brush for this because the spatter is very, very fine. I don't end up with big gobs of paint. Uh, my girl Sandy, she does the tap version where she uses the handle of another brush and taps like this. I usually end up with massive gobs of paint everywhere if I use that method. So I tend to like the, uh, the old toothbrush method. What kind of pen are you using? The pen is a Uniball Signo. It's a DX and the size is the 0 0.38. It is an ultra fine gel pen. The reason I like this one so much is because of that stainless steel ball. It rolls smoothly on acrylic paint. But the other thing is that when this ink is completely dry, I don't have that issue with smearing. And I'll, I usually just hit this with a couple of light coats of matte spray when I'm done, and then it's permanent. You don't ever have to worry about varnish moving it. But I do seal it afterwards just to be on the safe side, but full intense Japanese ink, so it's a nice rich black. And it's ideal for this type of thing. I love these. Are you going to finish the fourth leaf on the bumblebee? The fourth leaf on the bumblebee. Oh my goodness, I'm glad you spotted that. I didn't. I really should finish that. Good heavens. Oh, oh there's that ash fall from in there. Good heavens, I'm glad you spotted that. Is the pen permanent? Yes, it is. Well, like I say, I always will seal with a light coat of matte spray just to be on the safe side. Some varnishes are more finicky than others, so just to avoid any issues, I always hit it with a matte spray before I varnish. I've had a question. Okay. Could you do this on like planter stone? Yes, absolutely. Coasters? Yes, absolutely. So, we are almost there. Thank you for pointing out that fourth leaf. I almost missed it. So we are almost there. We have a couple more things to do. Um, my handsome assistant is going to go over to my desk and find my chipboard. You have another assistant? <laughs> no. <laughs> Either that or you're going to dig in that bin. What are we looking for? The blue basket. There's a package of chipboard with some pretty little... Just grab the basket. Thank you. Towards back chipboard? Yep. From Southern Ridge Trading. It's going to look like three little branches of leaves. You were in the right direction. Oh, there it is. So this is what I'm going to use next. This is a laser cut chipboard and it forms these wonderful little branches. I'm going to move these out of the way because we're going to make a mess here. Oh my gosh. Acrylic tips and these vacuum sealed bags are another thing that don't work. Okay, so these little chipboard things are wonderful, but let me tell you, they if you cut these out first, they're a bugger to paint. So I like to leave them in place and then paint them. And I'm going to do that with a stencil brush. Now I've poured out a little bit of, this is Decorts Extreme Sheen in the 24 karat gold. And I'm going to use a stencil brush to do this. Now I'm going to use a fair amount of paint and I'm just going to stipple the metallic onto them. Like so. I think that this is such a pretty little detail to add to things, and this chipboard is awesome. 
When you do the spatter, do you try to keep it only on the background? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it everywhere so that it goes on to the bees and the butterflies. I just, I find that it sort of unifies things and softens everything so you don't have as many hard edges and harsh tones. So I've got a little bit of gold all over this chipboard. So many possibilities. Add a magnet! <laughs> <laughs> Add a magnet, yes. What a great idea. So I've got metallic all over this chipboard. Now I'm going to pick up a little bit. You notice I'm not cleaning out that brush. I'm going to pick up a little bit of that cobalt teal hue. I want to give them a little bit of a patina, so I'm going to stipple a little of that on in just a few places. Usually towards the tips of the leaves, I kind of like that little bit of, you see it kind of gives it a greenish cast. There we go. And so when I separate that, I'm going to grab a clean piece of paper here. You can see that little bit of a patina on the on those pieces. So I'm going to set this aside to dry a little bit and then we're going to cut it out and adhere them to our pieces. So I'm going to bring these guys back in like so. Now in the pattern are these words dream big fly free and be fierce and this is our message so each one of these messages gets adhered to our piece and you can decide where these go that's entirely up to you i kind of pick and choose where i'm going to place them and that usually just Kind of happens and you're going to take your matte medium so I take my matte medium and I'm going to get that little piece of paper wet so I'm going to dip it into my water dish is this extreme sheen a bit translucent a little it's actually more opaque than most metallics so I'm going to lay that right into that matte medium. Maybe try to get it straight at least. Now I've got a fair amount of water on that uh, paper, so it's quite wet. And I'm going to get this one wet, the Be Fierce. I usually cut these out. You can tear them out um, or cut them out. But I like using edging scissors, the ones that you know have some funky lines some funky edges and pattern. I think they're just more interesting. Are you using these for something? Yep. Nope. Just leave them there. Okay. <laughs> and the Dream Big, I'm going to pop that one on. So moisten the paper. You'll find it's easier to get it to stick. And you won't get drips and runs and bubbles in the surface. And then you go over each of those with a light coat of the matte medium. And I put my arm in the matte medium. Picasso your arm next. <laughs> so I'm going to take my heat gun and quickly dry this. Doesn't take very long. There we go. Now this paper will come back to full white once it's completely dry. So we're going to set that one aside for a second. And let those dry a little bit. And now I'm going to take my decoupage scissors 
and I'm going to cut these leaves out. Now these are all conjoined in various places. So I cut those ones first, like that, so that it separates each of those branches. And then I cut them like that. And now we have branches. Can you use paper flowers instead of napping? You can. Um, I don't recommend it if you're going to have to trace something on because it's a little bit slick. But if you want to finish off with the matte decoupage, absolutely. Now you have, when it comes to adhering these leaves to this, you have a couple of choices. Um, I'm going to use the matte medium for this. It is a lightweight adhesive, so it will work just fine for what we're doing. Um, but you, if you want, prefer, you can use any type of an adhesive, whatever works, as long as it dries clear. So I'm going to choose where, which ones I'm going to use. Hmm. Let me see. I'm thinking this one. Now I might have to trim this one a little bit. That one might be too big. So I'm going to trim it down right here. It's a nice thing. I don't have to use it exactly how it is. Oh, I like that one. And I like this too. There's also nothing in the rule books that says it has to stay inside the confines of the ornament. It can come off the page. So I'm going to put a little bit of matte medium on my surface like so. But I'm also going to put a little bit on the back of this chipboard. Just enough to get it on there. And I'm going to apply it like so. So now it's going to stick. The matte medium dries perfectly clear, so if you get some onto the, uh, the piece, that's okay. And then I'm going to take this one, matte medium, and then I'm going to put it on the back of the chipboard as well. Now this chipboard is delicate. If you're going to adhere it to something rigid like this, then you don't really have to do much. If you're going to adhere it to something like fabric for decorative purposes, I would suggest using some gesso on it first, just to make it a little more stable. And then I'm going to, I kind of like this one going like that. And again, I want this one to come off the page a little. There we go. And now the dragonfly. I like the idea of having this going over the wings a little bit. It implies that he's sitting behind it. And it's not a, this one is not really bulky visually. There we go. So we have our chipboard in place. We have our butterflies done. And our bumblebees are done. So I would let this sit for about 20 minutes or so to let that matte medium completely dry. And then I would apply two to three light coats of Decorts matte spray, and that will finish them out very nicely. If you're going to use it as an ornament, don't push through from the back push through the holes from the front and that way your paper will stay in place you won't have to worry about it coming off. Uh, do you sell the chippy board leaves or where can I get them? You can find the chipboard leaves. I do have some available on my website but they are available from Southern Ridge Trading and their website is chipboard.ca. They have a great selection of chipboard of all different sizes, styles and designs. They also have wood surfaces to paint. 
uh, they have a great selection and really cool uh, decor ideas. Camera. Camera. <laughs> He's having trouble switching the camera. Camera. There we go. <laughs> so I actually had a question. Okay. That I felt was important. Okay. It's from Tammy. Okay. Tammy? Uh, it's a two-parter. When did you publish your first pattern? And what was it? And any advice for those wanting to break into the pattern packet publishing? Oh my goodness, my first pattern, oh, my very first pattern was 2001 and it was one called Time Flies. It was the first pattern I'd ever written up. It was also the first class I ever taught at a convention and that was in 2000, so 20 years ago. And if I had any advice for somebody um, wanting to do this, and it would be simple. Make sure that you know your process inside out and backwards and keep the, the wording of it when you write it as simple and as concise and as clear as possible and avoid using a lot of technical jargon. <laughs> that would be the best advice I could give you. And paint. And paint, 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 <laughs> paint. No. Know your process inside out and backwards. That's, that's the best advice I can give. That was uh, the question that actually caught my attention. That's a great question. It's a great question. Well, guys, that was it for these three pieces. I hope you enjoyed this. These are really fun to paint. They're not difficult to paint, um, but it is a process going through it. And um, if I can give you any advice about doing this is just play with it. Have some fun with it. And don't be afraid to make a mistake because a lot of the stuff that you learn comes from those mistakes. So jump right in, throw some color on things, um, grab a stack of inexpensive watercolor paper and just play. Try out stamps, try out stencils, try different color combinations, just play with it. You'd be amazed at what you come up with. And uh, you're a talented bunch, I know you can manage it. You're gonna do all kinds of cool things with it. Thanks so much for coming to play I, every Saturday. You have no idea how much it means to me to, to see you guys entering and, and coming and commenting and sharing and that's great because that's what this is all about is just sharing lots of fun stuff. So with that in mind, don't forget to hit the share button on this video, throw your name in the comments and I have a great little prize pack of stencils for one of you. So. Don't forget to comment, don't forget to share the video, and if you are not already subscribed to my YouTube channel, hop on over there. That's where we post these videos at the end of the at the end of the day. We also have a great midweek project, usually a short and sweet one, but we have a great project for you in the midweek. And if you're subscribed to my channel, you'll be notified about when they're posted. All right, guys, that's it for me today. I have to go get ready to teach this afternoon. Thanks again. Appreciate you. Mwah. Love you. Stay safe.